Spotify for Podcasters lets you record and edit podcasts right from your phone or computer. So no matter what your setup is like, you can start creating today. With Spotify for Podcasters, you can earn money in a variety of ways, including ads and podcast subscriptions. And best of all, it's all totally free with no catch. I highly recommend you give it a try. Download the Spotify for Podcasters app or go to spotify.com slash podcasters to get started. I'm Jason Palmer, one of the hosts of The Intelligence, The Economist's daily current affairs podcast. The Economist's award-winning shows make sense of what matters, from our special series on China's president to our weekly podcasts on business, technology, and American politics, our journalists provide fair, in-depth reporting on the events shaping the world. Search for Economist Podcasts Plus and sign up to our free one-month trial. And everyone around him tells him how exceptional and wonderful he is. And I think at the beginning of his reign, they mean it. The Tudor's Dynasty Podcast. Welcome to the Tudor's Dynasty podcast. I'm Mel Taylor, and today I'm talking to Rebecca Crossmore about her research and interest in the poetry written and recited at the court of Henry VIII. Rebecca is an associate professor of early modern literature at the University of Central Oklahoma, and the focus of her research has been the women who wrote poetry, and in particular, the verses of the Devonshire Manu- in the Devonshire Manuscript, which is kept in the British Library. Her book, Gender and Position Taking in Henrician Verse, was published by the Amsterdam University Press this fall. Welcome, Rebecca. Congratulations on your publication of the scholarly book. Thank you so much. For many of our listeners, 16th century poetry will be something that they may not have even looked at since they left school, particularly in the UK. Mm-hmm. Now, perhaps um, you could explain, you know, what... Why you talk about the Devonshire Manuscript, uh, what it is, why it's important, and who wrote it? Thank you, Mal. Um, Thanks so much for that lovely introduction and for the congratulations. Yes, um, I love talking about the Devonshire. um, And first, let me explain why. Um, When I first encountered the Devonshire, it was after getting what for people who go a bit deeper into 16th century poetry is kind of the standard introduction. You get Wyatt and you get Howard and you get a bit about Wyatt writing about Anne and then usually a mention that Anne might have written poetry. Um, Are but we talking we Anne Boleyn? Yes, yes, yes. Right. Um, that Wyatt is uh, probably, truly writing some of his poetry about Anne Boleyn, right? It's standard practice to compliment the queen through verse, but that then we get these echoes that, okay, probably she's writing. And I think often in that initial introduction, it's sort of treated as, well, Anne's exceptional, right? Anne Boleyn is an exceptional figure. And I didn't really question sort of in my early progress into 16th century poetry, what it meant that a woman was writing poetry or whether that was unusual, I just sort of categorized it in the special things about Anne category. And then I learned about the Devonshire um, and realized that women's roles were much more central in courtly verse production than I had previously understood. So the Devonshire is a verse miscellany from the 1530s and 1540s. Um, There's one later entry from the 1560s, probably. Uh, And by a verse miscellany, I mean it's a book where a group of people, in this case, um, verse miscellanies could be individually held, but in this case it isn't, a group of people are writing down verses to share in the group. And I know that's quite cloudy, but to share in the group is kind of the most we can say for sure. Probably sometimes they would have gone to this for a recitation. Probably sometimes someone would have written something in it to get feedback from their peers on, is this working? Is this nice? Um, Other times they would have written down something clever that they'd heard just to make sure it was sort of recorded. Um, And then they're even in the Devonshire, they're actually sometimes just writing to each other, little notes in the margins. Um, They do little doodles sometimes. Um, But it's widely agreed now 
the, the people in charge of this project, the people sort of coordinating the project are, and I'm going to go a bit in reverse order here of, of my personal level of interest, um, Mary Fitzroy, Nee Howard. So that would have been Henry Howard, Earl of Surrey's sister. Um, she had married Henry VIII's son out of wedlock, Henry Fitzroy, and so had become Mary Fitzroy. Not long after that marriage, Henry Fitzroy died. Um, and there's some complicated stuff there about um, her efforts to get recognized as his widow and get the property that was her rights. Um, but she is involved in the circle. How then there's Mary she? Yeah, Rebecca, oh. how old would she have been? She would have been about 16, 15 to 18 when most of this is being put together. Right. Um, and she was quite young at the time of the marriage, which is why it wasn't, uh, per all the records at least, wasn't yeah. consummated, which then mm -hmm. led to the problems she was, well, Henry led to the problems she was having, right? <laughs> um, but but the lack of consummation has something to do with it. Yeah, wasn't it wasn't it thought that um having consummating the marriage would actually weaken uh young Henry Fitzroy? Yes, yes. Um, um presumably they'd never met a teenage boy before. <laughs> um I mean it doesn't we'll put it it doesn't seem to have helped, did it? No, um, no precisely. <laughs> so who else? There was Mary Fitzroy. Yes. Um and then Mary Shelton, who uh, listeners to the podcast might actually be the most familiar with her, I think, of the three people involved, because she appears quite often in pop culture representations of the Tudor court. And um, usually, and in a thing that I have some feelings about, she's portrayed as a potential additional love interest for Henry VIII. Um, Ooh. I, I think that's pushing it a bit. Um but she's definitely this sort of, she emerges in the manuscript and what we can see of her writing as this a fairly funny and sharp and sensitive courtier. Um, I think she would have been certainly very engaging and interesting. Um, but it's even unclear in what we do have of whether the sort of scandal around them, um, where it's unclear if it's Henry's courtier who's interested in possibly her, or possibly her sister Madge. Um, and it's unclear if it's is a is a courtier interested in one of the two of them and they they get in a bit of trouble, or is one of Henry's courtiers sort of taking the fall for taking up too much of one of the Shelton sisters' attention and time when it's really Henry VIII who's done it. I understand um the desire to look at all of the sort of scandalous little bits and, and side affairs, but we have such great evidence for little scandalous love affairs that really did happen um, that I'm, I'm interested in looking at Mary Shelton as an author rather than just as somebody that maybe Henry yeah. might have been pursuing. Yeah, I can understand that. Um, what you probably don't know is that she's also the poster girl for the current exhibition at the Queen's Gallery of Hol Holbein's work that they hold. So Mary Shelton's face is all over London at the moment. So everybody will know who she is. <laughs> Back <laughs> to um, Anne's court. Um, it mm -hmm. seems very different from the court that Catherine of Aragon had, because that was very much a, a women only and men had to be chaperoned. I mean, this it's almost like a court of, you know, medieval courtly love and a bit along the lines. You and I have mentioned Baldassar. Castiglione's Courtier, but that was published in, what, 1528. So would it have made it to England by then? Would they have looked at that? Uh, so they do have, um, I mean, by the 1530s, I think you can see an influence of Castiglione's ideas. Um, and we certainly know that there's, there's um, commerce and travel going between England and Italy, right? Um, and so anything that's a hugely popular text one of the things that I'm often interested in in the book and sort of like if we go big picture on trying not to get too scholarly with it, but thinking about what I'm interested in as a scholar yeah. is the way that things have multiple sources of influence. Right. Right. And um, so um, 
I know that you had uh, John and Julia on doing doing this wonderful discussion of that mm. French influence. Um, and so uh, I definitely think we can pull back to that for some of the French influence. But the Italian influence is there, right? You have um, Thomas Wyatt bouncing back and forth between uh, England and Italy and, and Wyatt is a cultural mover in the court, I think it's fair to say. But also, um, one of the things that I'm interested in in the book is uh, a bit earlier, moving a bit away from the Devonshire, Henry has shown an interest in that courtly love tradition in his own early verse um, and in the way that he performs towards Catherine of Aragon. I love reading about the masks where he yes. shows up right in these various depictions as as the young lover um and sort of makes her the center of that so even though it does have that absolutely that that clearer separation of men's spheres and women's spheres i think we're seeing from henry already an interest in um in maybe thinking of something a bit more mixed as being a bit more modern and cosmopolitan right he's he very much wants to be seen as up to date and especially culturally, like somebody who's smart and knows about the arts. This goes this goes back to his sort of rivalry with Francis the First, doesn't it? With Yes. And absolutely. You know, well, you know, that that whole idea, I want to be a better king than you are. Yes. <laughs> I want to have better calves than you, right? Um for anyone who does it, <laughs> at one point Henry quite literally asks um, an envoy between the two courts if his calves are as good as Francis's. And I've always loved that anecdote. Um, just it's so Henry. Uh, and I, I'll admit, you know, in this outlet, I'm going to be kind of lighthearted about Henry. I don't want to downplay the consequences of no. his actions, but we've we've got 500 years padding between us now. Um, and some of the things that he does, you can now sort of laugh about even when they reveal uh, some of that deep egoism that is going to cause such such damage. Now, Thomas Watt, who who he Henry Henry has Thomas, doesn't he? Thomas Watt as a as a diplomat and going backwards and forwards to Rome and you know trying to process and get this push the the annulment forward. Do you think his he was jealous of Watt's talent as a poet? So. I love this question because I think I've got two contradictory answers, but I think they're both true. Um, I think that on one level, Henry buys into his own propaganda and everyone around him tells him how exceptional and wonderful he is. And I think at the beginning of his reign, they mean it. Um, I have a bit in the book about uh, something that's kind of heartbreaking to me is Erasmus's early praise of him, just knowing what would happen to so many people who Erasmus treasured as a result. But at the beginning, he's so excited about this new era for England. And uh, I, I can't say that I think Henry's poetry necessarily deserved the praise it was given. But on one level, he does know he is very smart and he is an exciting personality. And at first, I think there's a part of him that, that believes it. And I think there's another very important part of him that knows he can never believe it. And I think that leaves him in a space where he can't actually assess his own talent relative to Wyatt's. But I think we're, you know, how he can be so mercurial. And I think some of that has got to be earlier, very internal, where he's got to be fluctuating between I am the most important composer at my court. Ray Siemens has some great work. He's a, a scholar, really blazed a lot of paths in our field. And he has some great work with the Henry VIII manuscript talking about the fact that it's, it's only Henry's compositions that are picked out as sort of nice headings on the top of them that say, this is composed by the king, this makes it important, right? And another part of him that knows that if his work is being picked out in that way as being important that it because it's by the king, that it's it's not as good. Well, on the one hand, a premise of my work is uh, that poetry arises from community work, that these people are writing together. A lot of these people are very clever, very good writers, and Wyatt is definitely one of them. And I certainly, I, I can't compare Wyatt's poetry to Henry and think that Henry never noticed that it's better. But 
what I'm interested in about that jealousy, and this isn't a this is an agreement actually, but it's it's such an interesting question. I don't I don't think I have a firm answer to it. Is if he's jealous, why is Wyatt the one that survives? Is it because he's jealous that Wyatt survives? Is there something about that mercurial ability? So for listeners who need a quick refresher on this, Wyatt wasn't exactly accused alongside the other men who were accused with Anne Boleyn, but he sort of is. He's implicated. He's put in the tower for a bit at the same time, and he talks his way out or is pardoned for some other reason. And it's all very strange, especially because of the people that Henry would be jealous of, why it seems like the most logical one, certainly more logical than George Bolin, right? Well, the one thing which I was reading Wolf Hall recently, and one of the, the recurring themes throughout, because you're in you're in Cromwell's head all the time. That's, I think, the magic of Mantell's writing. And he has these conversations with the late Cardinal Wolsey, and he he remembers that Wolsey keeps saying to him, "Give Henry what he wants." And so Henry, and it, that seems to have been what happened when he, Henry was brought up as a child. He ne- mm-hmm. never had boundaries set, and then it, mm-hmm. he got the king came to be king, and there were no boundaries, and everybody was telling him how wonderful he was. He never really understood himself, and I think that's something which you know you see quite often with spoiled children, you know, they they don't know how to behave and they don't have any self-awareness. I think that's such a beautiful reading of, of Henry's personality and that idea that maybe in some way Wyatt is able to give him what he wants in a way that later Henry Howard, Earl of Surrey, if we want to speculate, and it, it is pure speculation, that some jealousy over Henry Howard's poetic ability might have influenced how Henry VIII felt about him, the animosity that he felt towards him. That with with Henry Howard, his well, he sees going, Henry uh, Howard, doesn't he, as a threat to the throne? He does, he does, and I don't think Howard is sort of, in terms of his personality, capable of giving Henry what he wants, which is capitulation. And Wyatt is capable of giving him capitulation. Would. There's a a letter that I mention in the conclusion to my book that I think is a great example of Wyatt giving Henry what giving Henry that capitulation. W- would you mind if I talked about that for a oh, moment? Oh, that would be great. No, fabulous. Okay. Um. So this is from Levant and Clements, I think. Uh, Renaissance letters. It's their edition of letters, and it's Wyatt writing to Henry sometime after he has been released, and he says the most shocking thing about Anne. Things that really don't match at all with the picture that we've got of Wyatt as as sort of, if not not in love with her, and I sort of don't read it as truly romantic love, um, but instead like a friend who values her and so who participates in her iconography, let's call it, because it's useful to her and because he does think she's interesting and captivating. I'm just not sure that he's in love with her. But he writes saying, I tried to tell you, Henry, that she had offered to sleep with me and that in fact she had interrupted a potential tryst with me to go be to go run off with someone else and have some sort of inappropriate conduct with them. And I I have a hard time with that as someone who likes why it's poetry because it's from a modern perspective, it's it's awful. It's so cowardly. And it I have to say it doesn't read as true. Um, the, it reads as, let me get myself out of this by doing whatever I have to, which is where I try to have some sympathy. I, I sort of put myself in my brain of, would Anne understand why he had done this? Would his friends who had been executed understand why he had done this? I think absolutely. If it's a complete fabrication, and it reads, it reads like a little kid explaining to you how the lamp got broken, passive voice intentional there. <laughs> Uh, it reads very frantic. But I wonder if there's also a way in which it's serving an additional purpose there of saying to Henry, whatever story you want to conduct, I'll I'll give it to you. I am going to capitulate. I am going to give you whatever it is that you want from me. And so the details of the story aren't really what matter. What matters is that he's saying to Henry, yes, 
uh, you want you want this to be the narrative, then yes, I will go along with that narrative. And Wyatt really can't afford to do anything else if he is if he is going to walk away from his various scandals and difficulties alive. It's disappointing, and yet at the end of the day, I'm still more sympathetic to Wyatt than to Henry Howard. Um, so, I think I think I think Wyatt's story is um, is is quite interesting because you know he he was his father married him off to I can't remember who it was, but they. It wasn't a good marriage. And then he was, um, he had this lover. I mean, she ran off with somebody else and they divorced. Did they divorce? Oh, goodness. Are you talking about Elizabeth Darnell? Yeah. Um, I don't remember how the Elizabeth Darnell story sorts out. Um, yeah, I, I must admit that that um, I was so, so taken with Wyatt's, the sketch that Holbein did of Wyatt's face. He looks so angry. <laughs> I need you it always seems so it's angry. quite extraordinary it, you see it on the screen and you think yeah Holbein's done a sketch of, of Thomas Wyatt you face the actual sketch itself and those eyes are flashing and I am so cross and I just want to you know I'm gonna have to do something about this and, and unfortunately he doesn't speak <laughs> but seeing those sketches it really does. It makes these people come alive. And I thought, wow. And, and of course, Wyatt's poetry has all of these sort of um, metaphors and, you know, allusions to classical history. What's he doing there? Is he is he using classical history and things to flatter the king or to make comment on the king? This, I think, uh, it's it's really, it's a core part of what I'm talking about in the book and of what other scholars of the period talk about as well. I think the difference is a little bit, what I'm trying to add is a somewhat different angle on it. Let me start with the agreed upon bit, is there is a strong precedent in the court for using classical and biblical illusion to talk about current events. So um, Henry is King David and uh, Wyatt referring to him as Caesar. And yes. so what level of education would Mary and Mary and Margaret and the other women, would they be educated to the same level as Wyatt and Henry Howard and the king? Or would that just be down to their fathers as saying yes or no? I actually I love exactly how you framed that, because it lets me set up the simplest answer, which is for all of those people, their educations are actually going to be quite individualized. And it is very much about the parents' choices. So there are certain things that you absolutely have to have. It doesn't matter what your parents' ambitions for you are, what sort of level you're at in the birth order or your gender. You have to be educated in behavior, period. You are going to be educated in some element of music. Um, you just are going to know things. And you are probably going to be educated in a additional language. Latin? Well, that depends. Um, so if you have somebody, uh, I talk a bit in the book about Jane Lumley, who I just adore. Um, and Jane Lumley is picked out as being somewhat, I'm cautious about exceptional because my whole point is like, let's revisit what women knew um, and how communal sort of these reading and writing networks were. But Jane Lumley, um, is historically exceptional in not only knowing Latin well enough to translate from it, but knowing Greek well enough to translate from it at 13. Wow. Yeah. And her father arranges her marriage quite early, but it almost looks, he's very concerned with his daughter's educations. And it almost looks like he gets her married early so that he can have a say in her husband's education as well. Um, she and her husband are seem to be mostly sort of literary collaborators. And she's also just a point to this idea that I say exceptional because anybody being able to translate out of Greek at 13 is exceptional. But she's also part of a circle of other educated women. There's a really beautiful anecdote that, oh goodness, what is a scholar who tells us about that? Peter Davidson. There it is. Uh, Peter Davidson talks about a gift that Anne Bacon sends Jane Lumley of this manuscript that I can't replicate Davidson's discussion of it, but it constructs itself like a house 
And so the way that courtiers would read a house is showing certain symbols. Um, this is part of how Henry Howard gets in trouble, and I'll I'll boil it down a bit in a second. But Henry Howard gets in trouble because of how people read his house. They read his houses using royal iconography for a reason, right? So they read these houses, and Davidson articulates the ways that this manuscript and Bacon sends to Jane Lumley reads can be read like a house. Um, it's really cool and really neat, but it shows these really learned women writing to each other. So whether you learned Latin or French or much more rarely Italian or Spanish um, or one of the Germanic dialects uh, is really going to do with what your family networks are. And that is true for men and women, though, yes, it is true that men tend to be educated in more languages additional things you know um they'd be looking at mathematics and geog but basically things like navigation so that they could go off and explore and but this strikes me that these women were being if you like educated to be wives of diplomats and to fulfill a certain role within the court and for mercantile reasons as well and I think also um to some extent as as diplomats themselves there's a lot of great work on how 16th century queens are ambassadors for their countries. Or if you think about, uh, I don't want to, I don't want to weigh us down on Margaret Douglas, but I did want to come back to her as um, the third contributor to the Devonshire manuscript. So Margaret Douglas is the most interesting person from the Tudor period that you don't know about. Her mother, right, had married James the Fourth of Scotland. So that's Margaret Tudor, Henry's sister, marries James the Fourth. She's this really important dynastic figure. And, and this is why I, I say, I think also to be uh, diplomats themselves, Margaret Douglas does not understand her position as contingent on her husband. Um, she, for a bit, is treated as potentially Henry's heir after he's, Fitzroy's dead and he's disowned Mary and Elizabeth. And per court documents of the period, Margaret Douglas is, is being treated as quite likely the heir presumptive. Then she makes a mistake. She contracts a marriage underneath Henry's nose that he doesn't approve of. But certainly the evidence from Elizabeth's reign is that Margaret Douglas thought she had a better claim to the throne than Elizabeth did. Also, tragically, Margaret Douglas, um, not that marriage, that marriage has a lot to do with the Devonshire manuscript, and maybe we'll come back to it, but it ends up not working out, um, and and the man dies. But her later, more successful marriage that Darnley is the result of, right. she outlived all of her children from that marriage, Darnley most dramatically, but all of them and her husband. Uh, and sorry, I should quickly note there, um, just to anchor you, because it's a lot of names, Darnley is the wife of... Or it's, <laughs> the husband of Mary, Queen of Scots, who um, is assassinated, and then the assassins blow up the house. It's a very dramatic event. But Margaret Douglas outlives all of her children, and she petitions for her daughter-in-law's rights to her son's titles and lands. So and claim to the English throne. Well, these would actually be the Scottish, but, I mean... She's also working very hard to make sure that her grandson ends up on the English throne. Yeah. But that is more in what we expect in, in gender at the time, right? Like that she would be fighting for James. Yeah, sure. We all expect that so the we, son is going to inherit. So going back to the Devonshire manuscript, and while she's not quite aware of the power that she actually has, she, I mean, she could have could have played that a bit better, couldn't she, really? Maybe. I guess it depends on, and I don't think anybody would say that there weren't warning signs about something was going to happen to Anne Boleyn, right? Um, <laughs> but do they really think that Henry is going to get rid of this woman that he has just overturned everything for? I I think in retrospect, it's easy to go, oh, well, she should have known but I think at the time it probably was quite shocking. And 
There's an interesting catch for me too. I'd love, I'd love, I'm going to bounce this back to you here in a second. So Margaret Douglas marries Thomas Howard, not the Thomas Howard, um, but one of his younger brothers, younger half brothers. And I say marriage, it's a degree of marriage in the period. It's, it's a form of what we might now refer to as hand fasting. Um, I tend to talk about them as married because I, they talked about it in their poetry to each other as my spouse, my wife. Um, but you'll see it also referred to as like a betrothal or a, a, an arrangement or something like that. That's That sort of um, arrangement gave them all sorts of license as well. And, on you know, being being allowed to be alone together. Um, yeah. So, that you know, you, you can imagine that two hot, I would, would say hot knickered, um, <laughs> <laughs> but two young people, you know, you can, you can see how the tensions build between them. It's... Uh, that's dangerous. Can we go back to to Anne's court, this courtly circle? I mean, it would have it would have had the people that she chose, but the king would have still had people in there. I mean, this is something you know they would be spying. I mean, they'd be career women, and they'd mm -hmm. be reporting back whether it's to Catherine or whether it's you know because. <laughs> It's still going on, and she's, you know, the, the, it hasn't. The situation hasn't been resolved, but the, this, there's this sudden great shift that where Henry gets fed up with Anne in what late 1535 or early 1536, and all of them seem to suddenly come into into what turns into almost like quicksand, where they'd obviously been having a wonderful time and it was like a later much later french salon and great um discussions and if you like a, a, a social elite with a huge intellectual capacity i mean it's nowadays we all sit in front of the goggle box and watch <laughs> on our phones and play games and watch game of thrones it's great but <laughs> it must you had to have a brain in those days and to be very aware of what was happening politically. I mean, um, I'm surprised that Margaret was so naive. I think naive is a good word. And that was part of what I was going to kind of um, bounce back, although I think you've just sketched out some of the complications. But whether you think um, that in, in early 1536, should people have been planning as though Anne was on her way out, um, you know, how dangerous do you think people should have assessed the situation as being? Because I, I think we could, without a time machine, we could ask 40 scholars this and get 40 different answers. But what do you think? I asked uh, John Guy this question. I said, you know, was Anne planning to try and get rid of Cromwell? And he said, no, she wasn't the danger. It was George. Oh, yeah. OK. And I, that took me completely by surprise. And of course, there are. You know, of course, George gets set up like his sister. Mm -hmm. Is he also part and parcel of this poet poetry circle? Did he write verses as well? Oh, I know, he, I know he translated Det Up's work, but did he actually write verse as well? According to other courtiers, yes. And I find this absolutely heartbreaking. Um, we don't have anything that we can confirm as being George Berlin's now. My point and claim about all of this poetry is that I think we are too quick to say, and I'm I'm not the first person to say this, lest I sound like I'm, you know, sort of a young scholar going rogue. Arthur Marathi said years ago that we have been too eager to assign things to Wyatt from the Devonshire. Um, and that that's a problem because it misrepresents Wyatt's work. It misrepresents a lot of these works as single authored when they might actually result from people sort of writing back and forth to each other. So I think that if we, given what we have, if you wanted me to place a bet that there's a few lines in there that George Bolin wrote, sure, I'd, I'd place that bet. But we're, we're not yet at a point where we can know, yes, this is a verse by George Bolin. And I'm not sure that we are going to find those records. Though I will know, I think a theme that I've heard um, from earlier visitors on the podcast is when we went and looked at the archive, we found this thing that we people hadn't looked for because they assumed it wasn't there, right? Um, I think women's writing is a great example 
of oh, I agree that, that that's happened too. Um, but I, I would love to have something as much as I'm trying to engage in their communal writing. Uh, you know, the the modern mindset is hard to shake, and I do I have that urge to have something that we can say yes. George wrote this. We talk a lot about Wyatt's poetry, but we haven't actually heard any. Would you care to to give us a what inspired him and an example of um, his version or um, another poem by him? Yes, absolutely. So um, I am going to somewhat selfishly uh, just go with my very favorite poem of Wyatt's, uh, Who So List to Hunt, which is uh, a translation of Petrarch. And a lot of Wyatt's work is translations of Petrarch. Um, now, Chaucer had brought um, translations of Petrarch into his work as well. And so I think there's something cool and interesting there, both along the side of, um, you know, Petrarch writing in the vernacular in his sense, and then Chaucer using Petrarch these, when he's these, writing in the yeah, English vernacular. These, these men, Petrarch and Chaucer, are writing in the 14th century or 15th century. Mm -hmm. The 14th and 15th century are now influencing what in the 16th century. So there's a lovely continuation there. Yes. The Tudor poets, um, and Wyatt certainly among them, are really interested in using Chaucer to start to define like a national identity that has to do with literature. Um, and so I think it's not accidental then, right, that they also... So they're using Petrarch as an Italian example of that, but also I, I suspect because Chaucer did it. And they want to sort of create a continuation there. So, whoso list to hunt, I know where is in hind. But as for me, alas, I may no more. The vain travail hath wearied me so sore, I am of them that farthest come behind. Yet may I by no means my wearied mind draw from the deer, but as she fleeth afore, fainting, I follow. I leave off, therefore, since in a net I seek to hold the wind. Who list her hunt, I put him out of doubt, as well as I may spend his time in vain. And graven with diamonds and letters plain, there is written her fair neck round about. Nole me tangere, for Caesar's I am, and wild for to hold, though I seem tame. Whoa, whoa, <laughs> the imagery there is absolutely wonderful. <laughs> I love so who is the hind? So um, I'd love to get your take on this as well, because we know that Wyatt was genuinely, well, as far as we can say this at a, at a 500 year remove, very in love with Elizabeth Darnell. That seems to have been quite true. Um, I read this poem though, as a genuine compliment to Anne. And I want to explain why pointing to some of the contradictions with Petrarch. Um, first, uh, it, Wyatt doesn't necessarily need to pursue Elizabeth. Um, she isn't this sort of captivate, I, not that she wasn't like an interesting person in her own right, um, but this isn't this sort of game of chase in the same way. And Wyatt is saying, I actually am giving up on possessing this thing. And then it's the end to me that is actually the really beautiful compliment. From in the last three lines, really, why it ends, there is written her fair neck roundabout. No le mi tangere, apologies for my poor Latin, for Caesar's I am, and wild for to hold, though I seem tame. Okay. In Petrarch, the, the written round is earlier, and I'm going to use um, Klein's English translation here rather than subject anyone to my Italian. In Petrarch, the last six lines go, touch me not in diamonds and topaz was written round her lovely neck. It pleased my Lord to set me free. There is a huge difference between it pleased my Lord to set me free and Caesar's I am. Very much. Yes. And then Petrarch actually ends with something that isn't in Wyatt's at all. The sun had already mounted to midday. My eyes were tired with gazing, but not sated when I fell into water and she vanished. Why it ends us instead with, and I love this, it's my reading, but I still like it. 
wild for to hold though I seem tame. And I want to jump up earlier in Wyatt's version of the poem to who list her hunt I put him out of doubt as well as I may spend his time in vain. And the line just before that, even in a net, I seek to hold the wind. I think there is a heavy suggestion here that Henry can put whatever diamonds he wants. This is not a tame deer. Um, Caesar's I am not like you aren't Caesar's if you're not a tamed animal, right? He may have sort of possessive rights over you relative to other people's ability to poach you metaphorically. Um, but why it ends by saying, I see you. Um, I see that you are not tamed by this caller. I see that like, like that you are to, to try to possess you wholly is makes as much sense as trying to possess the wind. Um, and I actually don't read the Wyatt Bolin relationship as romantic in the classical sense, romantic in a sexual sense. There's a philosophical concept of romantic friendship, but I think that friends can have a complementary sort of erotic charge to each other, and that it helped Anne's brand to have one of the most talented court poets writing these kinds of things about her. And if I got this from someone, I would think it was a beautiful compliment, especially if I was feeling a bit boxed in um, by a relationship that was putting new new rules and regulations on what I could and could not do. Um, that said, I would love to hear sort of your take on on what you think of the poem or who you might I be love it. about. Yeah, I've always loved that poem. But what I find interesting, if it fell into the wrong hands, it could be misinterpreted and twisted to be something which, well, depending on who's actually telling the story. Mm -hmm. um, and I wonder, did it? do we know whether it appeared anywhere in the trial or in the conversations of the papers leading up to the trial? Or, you know, is it? Because to me, it you could also be seen as a warning to Henry. Henry, you don't know what you've got because she's <laughs> as wild as they come. And it doesn't matter how many diamonds you give her, she'll do exactly what she wants. I think that, and I mean, I think that this is fair in the sense of one, I'm really interested in multiple readings at the court. And also that when we like someone's writing, um, we can want we can want to read them generously, right? Um, so where the warning to Henry reads a bit misogynistic and it's like, well, that's fair. Wyatt is a man in the 16th century. He he can't help but be misogynistic. He doesn't have another option. Um, but then also I, I, I think if I understand correctly, um, I think John and Julia have a bit of a different take on this from mine, but I'll, I'll share where I land on this in the book is I think poetry can be part of the conversation but it is not entered as evidence at trial because I would argue of like the actual verse itself, not it, verses were exchanged and they're being too flirty. I think this is because Henry had assigned verse and I talk about this in the book and I'm, I'm drawing here from Peter C. Hermans and, and uh, Ray Siemens. Henry had created Verse is a place where you could argue with people with more authority. So he used verse, um, a great example from Siemens and Herman, um, is Henry wanted to modify the coronation oath. Uh, he wanted to say that he would follow uh, the laws of England insofar as they were not prejudicial to his prerogative. And his advisor stepped in and said, absolutely not, you can't do that. Um, and so then he writes into his verse, a lot of these sort of moments of youth triumphing over aged advisors and this idea that if the youth has sufficient authority, it, it can't be constrained, right? So he had created this space where poetry was a place where you could say things you couldn't say. Um, the most famous example of this is how Henry Howard Earl of Surrey writes wild things about Henry. There is no way that you can read the Assyrian king in peace with foul desire, which ends by saying that the only manful deed left to the king is to kill himself. Um, it, it gets an incredibly strong verse. And yet that poem is not used as evidence at Henry Howard's trial. Um, so I think there's something there about, about the uh, 
the privilege of poetry, though, um, you know, because I'm looking at a little bit of a different angle on the court, um, I wouldn't, I wouldn't endorse my opinion on the Boleyn trial specifically over some of the other guests you've had on the podcast. Well, I think I think some of some of the idea, the way of poetry, is actually sowing a seed within a mind, and so that mm -hmm. it can be used to, if you like, sway somebody's opinion um, and other pressures, which we probably don't even know about, um, because human nature doesn't change, does it? Mm -hmm. And it's the one constant. It's power, ambition, greed, everything that along those lines. And just to be able to use poetry to push forward an idea mm -hmm. without actually landing yourself in hot water. Mm -hmm. uh, and also, it wouldn't come up in, you know, who's going to believe a poet? You know, they're daydreamers. <laughs> you know, who's going to believe a poet? Don't put him on the stand. But it's just sufficient to push somebody else over the edge and possibly tell mm, little bit of porky pie or the way that we talked about like um you know because when i'm when i'm feeling generous towards wyatt i'm inclined to read it as a compliment but your point about that same compliment lands um very misogynistically could land very misogynistically just to a different reader um could we could we draw a second example of poetry in here to think about yeah. Yeah. Different ways of reading. Um, I would love to read a poem by Margaret Douglas. Um, just in my, you know, if we're if we're bringing in Wyatt, let's bring in one let's of the women. Let's bring in a woman. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Um, and I think it's a great example how you can read it differently based on different audiences. I could talk about this poem for mm, probably hours, ask my students. So I'll read it and then I'll just suggest a couple of things. But I would say to listeners, if you're interested in this poetry, um, Elizabeth Heal actually did a, a modern edition of the Devonshire, which would be maybe a little bit more readable to a general public because it uh, Tudor poetry predates standardized spelling, which can make it quite challenging. Um, Douglas probably speaks with a Scots accent, given her upbringing, possibly at least. And we know that accents can come through in the writing, complicating it further. And then also they did things like make spelling tricky to mm -hmm. add another layer of protection to their poetry, right? Um, but you could read Elizabeth Hill's modern edition. And if you want it, if you just Google <laughs> um, or Bing or whatever your preferred search engine that maybe isn't <laughs> um, you know, involved in quite as many lawsuits right now, um, if you wanted to look at any of those options, you can look up a social edition of the Devonshire manuscript. And those exact words, a social edition of the Devonshire manuscript, will take you to a web page where you can see transcriptions of the original spelling, though we're scholars, so we'll argue about whether all the transcriptions are exactly the same amongst all people. And then to the right of each transcription, you can see um, a facsimile of the page from the Devonshire manuscript. And so you can see Margaret Douglas's handwriting. You can see Mary Shelton's handwriting. So even if you can't read the older hands, which is very normal, um, you still get get a sense of them that I think is it's fun. So if it's okay, I'll dive into this poem. Over to you. <laughs> now that ye be assembled here, all you, my friends, at my request, especially you, my father dear, that of my blood are the nearest, this unto you is my request, that you will patiently hear by this my last words expressed, my testament entire. And think not to interrupt me, for such wise provided have I, that though ye willed, it will not be. This tower is high, you see, is strong and high, and the doors fast barred have I, that no white my purpose ne let should. For to be queen of all Italy, not one day longer live I would. Wherefore, sweet father, I, you pray, bear this my death with patience, and torment not your hairs gray, but freely pardon mine offense, since it presideth of lover's fervence and of my heart's constancy. Let me not from the sweet presence of him that I have caused to die. Ooh. So, 
Um, Douglas did not uh, die or with apologies for the lack of trigger warning, commit suicide, which I think is at least gestured at um, yeah. in the high tower and the, the doors fast barred. Um, she went on to have a happy marriage, albeit not one with a happy ending. Um, but as a poem written after everything that has happened in her match with Thomas Howard, which is Henry's imprisoned them in the tower, because of Margaret Douglas's social position, she's been allowed to move to Sion Abbey, um, but Howard has still been kept there. She's released on, I want to say it's October 29th of the following year from Sion Abbey. She's allowed to return to court. And two days later, Thomas Howard dies of, um, of some sort of respiratory infection, and a, a cold, a, a sinus infection, something like this. Um, and then she writes this poem. Now, relevant here is a little bit of biography. Margaret Douglas actually spent the first few years of her life at the English court before she was returned to her father. Her father then used her as a bit of a political tool because um, her mother and father really hated each other. And they were granted a divorce uh, when Douglas was in her teens. And ultimately, Mary Brandon, knee tutor, knee, a million other things, um, but uh, she steps in and gets her niece returned to Mary Tudor, the former, the future Mary the First household. So both at the beginning of her life and then in these formative teen years, Margaret's father might very well, like her father figure is probably Henry VIII. So I want yes. to go back to that, like Henry's ego versus his knowledge. I don't think there's any way that you know Margaret Tudor, the kind of woman who would write something like this, and don't read this as angry. What do you, Did you hear some anger in this? I heard rebellion. Yes. I don't know whether it be anger. I certainly heard rebellion. It's a very powerful poem. But certainly the I heard that rebellion and it's, you know, it, it's forceful. Yeah. I've, I've trapped you here and you're going to listen to me. And also, yes, it's so interesting, right, this fantasy of putting Henry in a tower where he has to listen <laughs> to you. Um, but at the same time, she's cloaked it with this deniability, right? Yeah. Um, if Henry is in his egotistical mode uh, and in the 1530s, that's increasingly becoming his his default. Yeah. He could say, OK, you are you're admitting you were wrong. Mm, yes. Margaret Douglas, I think, apart from being a fascinating character, her naivety, when she's writing that, how old is she? Oh, goodness, let's see. She was born in 1515. So she's she the same, would be... just a year older than um, Princess Mary. I'm going to call her Princess Mary because then we know that, she, you know, we know who we're talking about. So, yeah, yeah. so she's... Yeah, so she, you know, we're talking, we're talking, she's coming up to 20. She would be 21 or 22, presuming this postdates Howard's death. And it yeah. sounds like it does with that last line. Unless that we're last line, yes, I would say it. that. So you would have thought that she would have, she would have known exactly what she was talking about there. Mm -hmm. And really pushing the boundaries um, yeah, so I'm going to retract rebellion and say, yes, I agree, anger. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think, but I think she has to have it both ways, right? Yeah. Um, or else it's much too dangerous. Um, if, it's, if it's just anger, if it's just sarcasm, then Henry, you know, in the, in the forgiveness part, if she's just, it, she's got to have it where he could maybe believe it. Um, and yeah. I think that's really an appeal to his... Um, to his ability to assume that people must, at the bottom, really love him, even as he's constantly showing this insecurity that maybe it's not true. I think that was the real core of Henry. He he wanted to be, you know, have that unconditional love from everybody, didn't he? Um, yes, I love the way Julie and John talked about that on your... Yeah, um, and, and he, it reminds me of somebody I know who, who had a very privileged <laughs> upbringing... And he's very much like Henry VIII. And when they were talking about that, I I thought, yeah, I recognize <laughs> that. It, nothing's changed. But it's that's a very powerful poem. But later on, you talked about Jane Lumley. Mm -hmm. 
um, you know, once all the hoo-ha of, of uh, the Devonshire manuscript and Wyatt and Henry Howard have all died down, mm -hmm. um, what about Catherine Parr? Oh, thank you. I would love to talk about Catherine Parr. Um, I know I've, I've heard a few guests on the podcast kind of come back to her. So I'm not sure it's necessarily true anymore that she's as undertreated as she was. But um, given how important she is to our understanding of women's place in literary culture at the court, I still think vastly undertreated and such an obvious touchstone for us in terms of saying, wait, clearly men weren't the only ones writing in the 1540s because Catherine Parr comes out with Psalms or Prayers in 1544. Mm -hmm. um, now that's an anonymous text, but Micheline White has at this point, for my money, very clearly shown Psalms or Prayers is definitely R. Um, and Micheline White is definitely an academic writer, but if you're able to catch any of her um, public facing work, if you're, you know, a talk that she's giving or anything, I really can't over recommend her for talking about Parr and also talking about Parr and Henry as collaborators. It's just really great stuff. So it's Psalms or Prayers in 1544, Prayers or Meditations in 1545, and then Lamentation of a Sinner in 1547. And those two latter texts have her name on them um, and say, this is the the queen or the former queen by 1547, by the date of publication for Lamentation of a Sinner, um, writing these religious texts. What was already established is um, Parr writes these largely as kind of pastiches, uh, not in the classic literary sense, but in the sense of literally like a collage of pulling together from different sources. Several scholars had already pointed out that that's something that she's borrowing from uh, prominent male writers at the time. One of the things I'm interested in when we pull in the Devonshire and pull in similar courtly uh, miscellaneous manuscripts, and we see that women were participating there, then we see that they're doing that kind of collage work with poetry. And so then we can maybe start to think about Parr as borrowing that, or not, not necessarily borrowing, I don't love that, uh, sorry, immediately, participating in that she's not just participating in this print male tradition, which also isn't only male, because Parr is right there showing us it isn't, but also that she's participating in this manuscript culture. And in fact, most of her works, all, all three of her works, she does manuscript editions of them. And one of them um, is in little, uh, uh, critics call them versicles, but they're formed like poetry verse would be. And so to me, that emphasizes that manuscript connection. When she commissions this manuscript, she asks for it to be written down on the page in a different way than the print page looks. And it feels like that then is participating in that um, that literary culture. And also remember, I talked about Anne Bacon's gift to Jane Lumley. Well, these are gift editions. Um, and so it seems to be drawing on something where um, where we already have more scholarship showing how much women were participating in gift exchange networks that often included manuscript poetry. I'm looking, thinking this is, you know, I'm, I'm immersed in the 16th century as we're mm -hmm. talking and, and I I can see you know Catherine Parr and and earlier and they're handing around these manuscripts and they're exchanging notes how come that it's lasted so long is this because they were published um you know <laughs> you know the new technology of printing you know <laughs> how did it come to you know how do we know all of this so i love this Base because it's both part of my argument for why we need to pay more attention to Henry verse, and some of my argument for I think we've made some mistakes that we pull backwards. The classic sort of tome for preserving Tudor court poetry um, is Bottles. Um, it's actually called Songs and Sonnets by the Right and Honorable Sir Henry Howard, Earl of Surrey, or uh, Henry Howard, Earl of Surrey, and others. Um, but we usually call it Bottles Miscellany. Uh, mispronunciation intentional? I don't know why. Um, but it just, speaking of mistakes that get pulled forward, right? Yeah. Um, 
So to me, the, the issue with Tuttle's, and I would point reader, while these are academic texts, uh, I definitely think listeners could have been Megan Heffernan's Making the Miscellany and Christopher Warner's Making and Marketing of Toddles. They're scholarly texts, but they are, I think, fairly accessibly written. I'll be candid that I think they're probably more accessible than my own monograph, um, just because they're you know participating in different conversations. But Heffernan shows us that we put a little too much, not a little, we put rather too much weight on toddles. And it distorted our idea of the literary landscape. And what I would add to that is toddle put Henry Howard's name right there on the title page, right? To authorize it, to add weight to it. Yeah. And he includes a lot of anonymous poems, but he tends to pick out ones that are by people he thinks are important. And so then we get this idea of, so the important authors are Henry Howard, Earl of Surrey, and Thomas White. And then Henry VIII gets to be important, but not as an author, which fair. Um, but I was asked at a, at a conference, and I talk about this in the conclusion to the monograph, if I think any of the works and toddles might be by women. And yes, um, I, I don't know that I've got any way to prove that short of a lifetime in the archives, which unfortunately being located in the central United States is going to be tricky. Um, but I don't see how it couldn't. If we look at these, these verse manuscripts in their original form where they're being passed around and women are participating, well, Tottle takes that and he makes some different choices. Warner has a lot to say about how those choices get made. But also we know that people misattributed things, right? That happens all the time in early print books. And I use the word misattribution because I'm writing to modern audiences. I'm not actually sure they would have even thought about it that way. I think they sometimes meant something more like in the style of. There's a very popular edition of Chaucer at the time that includes works that they seemed to know weren't by Chaucer, but they were Chaucer-esque. Um, and so they got put in. And also I just, they don't have our assumptions about what authorship means. And so if you're used to writing poems by passing them around, you're not going to assume that a name on the page means this person and only this person wrote this thing, which of course is misleading about modern authorship at all as well, right? Um, authors don't write every word in the books entirely by themselves. There have been editors, most people have writing groups, People have given input, but I think that's even more true. That said, you know, it's possible that there's an alternate history there where Pottle doesn't print songs and sonnets and we get a, a different vision of literary history. But it's also equally possible, I think, that Toddle doesn't print that. And so we aren't interested in it at all and don't go back to it at all. Um, so I think those sort of, when I say that Toddle distorted things or our our work with Tottle. It's not it's not his fault. He couldn't have known um, that our work with Tottle distorted things. I don't mean that I wish it hadn't happened. I just mean let's go back and look and see what's what's true sort of behind the curtain. Right. Well what what's come out in our in our discussion for me is that all of this is your work, their work, is very much teamwork. That's very much how I think about it. I actually, I don't want to derail this, but I'm just curious if I could ask you, as an art historian, right, yeah. speaking about it from that angle, talking about workshops and that sort of, I, th I think in modern conversation, workshops are often sort of um, treated as, as less than but I yeah. wonder, do you have anything to say about that and about the role of the workshop in art production at the time? Or Well, well art production, if you, it, it also goes through to people like Warhol and de Koenig and Damien Hirst and various other people. Um, and even Leonardo, particularly the da Vinci Salvatore Mundi. You know, the main artist would have done the most important bit, like the hand or the face. Mm -hmm. And you would have had people preparing pigments. You would have had people who were very good at background, or you start off the apprentices who are beginning to paint on that and uh, on the background and someone doing robes and shadows, then they might progress on to 
various other areas and so that they get more and more uh, skilled. And, right. you know, they, they can either, they will get to journeyman level where they then have to do their masterpiece and then buy their way out and become a member of a guild. You know, they would then set up their own workshop. But these these people were actually doing it as a business. You know, they weren't celebrities like Michelangelo. Michelangelo, Raphael and Leonardo, they are the, if you like, the three very key uh, Renaissance men. They're the one, the beginning of celebrity art, artists. Mm -hmm. Women artists, like my particular study, which is Lavina Tierlink, disappeared. Mm -hmm. Vanish. Susanna Horenboot disappeared. Both mm -hmm. key to Henry's court and, in Tierlink's case, right the way up to Elizabeth. And I, I see poetry in the, in the miniatures, particularly with the symbolism that's, that's contained within those works, you know, the, 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 the pansies, the, the flowers, the flames, you know, I'm burning up with passion. That's Hilliard. Mm -hmm. He did a lovely one like that. But all of those things, you can use, there are great parallels between poetry and, and, and art, and particularly the portrait miniature. And likewise, I think that collaboration between, particularly for miniatures, would only be between the artist and the patron mm -hmm. because they're so small and i mean literally they are that big mm -hmm. so you couldn't have a workshop but the big table portraits uh yes you would have people doing all sorts of it'd be a busy place would that yeah. be the same if you were doing a a portrait um a poetry workshop you know you've got this group sitting there and they're all sitting there with a glass of wine and <laughs> discussing so-and-so's latest verse and they say well if you do that would it we could improve that. Would that be the sort of thing would happen? It feels to me like, again, it's the sort of thing where without, I think maybe a little bit more ambiguity sometimes than with, you know, a painting where you can say, yes, okay, we definitely know because we have records of how they, of how they worked in this way. Um, one, I, I actually, this has always been a very funny example to me. The Norton mentions this in, uh, Ozymandias, um, where he King of Kings, he, he claims, uh, where he he claims to have written it in a dream vision all at once, and then they went through his papers and found all the drafts. Right, um, so <laughs> poets are notoriously unreliable self narrators. Um, but in the Devonshire, you can certainly see people responding to and riffing off of each other in a way that suggests that they're comfortable commenting on each other's works. Um, you can see them scratching out spellings to replace things. You can see them. Um, playing with order. And I have to think that that influences what I'm, I'm not sure how they would have understood a final product, right? Like, unlike with a painting where it's like, well, there it is. There it is. That's well, done. Mm. But at the same time, I actually like some, some series in artwork, right? Where they'll do copies of it. And it's like, well, oh, which yeah. is there's three versions of Cromwell's uh, Master of the Jewel House, and they were probably all done for the Cromwell family to be in different houses. So Holbein would have done the first one, then you know, they would take uh, that and pinprick it through and then everybody else would do, somebody would do the table, somebody would do the prayer book, somebody else, and Holbein might paint the face. And yes. that would be it. Yeah, I think that's a great, and of, um, you know, it, it sounds like in that case there's maybe a clearer original. Mm. In poetry, often there's a, a prioritization of the finished product rather than the original, right? Yeah. But who's to say when they would have called it finished? Um, right. if it if it's branched off and now there's versions of it in sort of different circles, are they thinking of it as something that has an end? Um, and so I think it, it I think it's more alive for them in some ways. I must admit, I found this fascinating, and the whole idea of you know an insight into a completely different area of the normal if looking at history i mean poetry it's not really often discussed it's been wonderful thank you and i love the idea of the teamwork and and again women having far more authority and being part of if you like an educated intellectual elite it's just the it's such a shame that henry didn't really quite buy into all of that <laughs> in many ways. Well Although, I mean, you know, he, as you point out, um, the women artists um, that even this sort of most famously misogynistic king 
it saw some space for women's intellectual and artistic endeavors that we're still fighting to take back. Um, but I love, I love, thank you so much for letting me draw some analogies to the art and, and letting us flesh those out as well. That was wonderful. Well, I could talk to you all day. It's been absolutely fantastic. <laughs> well, I wish you all success with the book and thank you very much. It's been absolutely tremendous. Thank you, Mel. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Tudor's Dynasty podcast. You can follow and support the Tudor's Dynasty podcast on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Patreon at Tudor's Dynasty.